the father of the New Thought movement, the Yankee mystic, the mesmerist. In this video, we'll be thinking about Phineas Quimby. Welcome to the Numinosophy Academy. My name is Lewis. If this is your first time here and you have an interest in Western esotericism, exploring the imaginal and the path of the mystic, then do join us by subscribing and clicking the bell so you don't miss anything. Our story begins in 19th century America. Phineas Quimby was born in New Hampshire, but lived most of his life in Belfast, Maine, where he worked as a clockmaker and ultimately, as we will come to see, as a spiritual healer. From an early age, Quimby suffered from tuberculosis. Tuberculosis was an infectious, very common disease in the 19th century, one of the biggest killers. It was so widespread because of factory pollution and the increasing density of population in urban areas. And there was no cure. The symptoms could only be managed. 19th century doctors sought to do this with cod liver oil, opium, or calomel. It was calomel, a popular substance consisting of mercury and chlorine, which was prescribed to and consumed by Quimby in great quantities. The quantities were so great that Quimby began to suffer from mercury poisoning symptoms and his teeth began to rot and fall out. In his early 30s, he was a desperate man, a man in pain, a man disillusioned with the countless doctors who were over-prescribing him drugs that were propelling him towards an early grave. But deliverance came. A friend had suggested to him the ancient practice of vigorous horseback riding to improve his health. Feeling too sick, however, to attempt such a feat, he opted for the next best thing, riding in his carriage. At first, he found himself so weak that he struggled to even raise up his whip to drive the horse on. But excitement overcame him. He drove his horse fast, up and down, and when he did eventually restable his horse, he felt invigorated and strong. And this began for Quimby a period of self-exploration and self-experimentation. One thing was for sure, his doctors did not have the answer. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Atlantic, there was a fad that had taken Europe by storm. Mesmerism a therapeutic system that had been developed by the German physician Franz Anton Mesmer. He theorized the existence of an energetic fluid that permeated all living things, including us, which he called animal magnetism. Animal magnetism, Mesmer believed, could be manipulated in one's patients to induce healing, to unblock where the flow had been interrupted. Mesmer would do this by sitting in front of his patients, knee to knee, pressing the patient's thumbs into his hands and looking directly into their eyes. Before moving his hand from their shoulders down along the patient's arms, manipulating the psychical fluid, before he would press his fingers upon the patient's lower stomach, often for long stretches of time, which induced a whole plethora of responses in particular by some patients, that the energy that had been coursing through their bodies caused convulsions and even brought about healing. One of Mesmer's students, the French doctor Charles Poyen, was one of the first to bring this philosophy, this therapeutic system, to the United States. He was the student who popularised the craft. He toured throughout New England, and in the process went well beyond merely healing. He diagnosed diseases, located lost objects, and read minds. Along the way, Charles Poyen collected his own disciples as he penetrated the 19th century liberal American conscience. And one of his disciples was, of course, Phineas Quimby. Quimby, having experienced Poyen's mesmeric abilities, in 1836 was so impressed by him that he left his job as a watchmaker to follow Poyen and learn the art of mesmerism. Quimby became accomplished in the art, but he began to notice as he went around healing people 
that his healing abilities relied less upon the specific mesmerism techniques that had been taught to him and had much more to do with the beliefs of the person in question he was attempting to heal. This belief would manifest as images. In the case of his own health, for instance, it was said to him when he was very young by doctors that his health suffered because his kidneys were wasting away and that his lungs were ossifying. This belief, this image in his mind, is what Quimby believed had the adverse effect on his health. He suffered believing he would never rid himself of his suffering. His own healing then required a shift in his own belief. When he changed his belief, which he began to do, prompted by the horse and cart experience, his body began to heal. He concluded then that the illness was basically a matter of the mind, the result of wrong beliefs. Quoting Quimby, your happiness and your misery are in your beliefs. If one could remove erroneous beliefs and images from one's mind, you could be healed. And if applied to others, one could heal others. For this reason, Quimby's practice ultimately moved away from mesmerism. And instead, his mental healing method consisted of him simply meeting with patients one on one, sitting with them sympathetically, in silence, tuning into them so that he could discern the other person's thought and image world. After a period of time, he would then simply talk with the patient about their own imagery world and how they should and could change it, thus enabling them to bring about their own healing. With the power of suggestion, or what we would call today hypnosis, Quimby would empower his patient to believe in their own healing. This is Quimby's very simple idea. If you change your thinking, you can change your world. In a moment, we'll look at those specific individuals who came to him as patients, were taught by him, and ultimately carried his ideas forward. But before that, we'll consider Quimby's impact more generally. His simple idea marked the beginning of the New Thought movement in the United States. New Thought today is a broad church of individuals, thinkers, writers, and religious denominations who believe in some version of this simple idea, that our mental states manifest our reality. And if only we can literally think new thoughts, new stories about ourselves and about the universe, shedding in the process old patterns of thought which have been for us self-destructive, narratives that we have repeated to ourselves ad nauseum, we can grow in terms of health, success, well-being, etc. The impact of this idea on Western culture explicitly and implicitly cannot be overstated. It is everywhere. You find it in the self-help industry, you find it in politics, in business management, in education, in religion, both at the liberal and conservative end of things. And even if you have never heard of New Thought or Phineas Quimby, you've almost certainly encountered his idea. Question for the comment section below. Where have you encountered this mental states manifests your reality idea? As per those individuals then who came to him for healing and subsequently carried his ideas forward, the two most notable were Warren Felt Evans and Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy took Quimby's healing methods and with them established her own conservative Christian denomination, the Church of Christian Science. She attempted to distance herself from Quimby and claimed that it was she who originated these ideas. In terms of the development of new thought, many of its early advocates were individuals who were initially swept up into Christian science before going in their own direction, most notably Emma Curtis Hopkins. Warren Felt Evans was a very influential early new thought proponent who, unlike Quimby, was well-educated and so was well situated to develop the philosophical underpinnings for Quimby's mental healing methods. It was Evans 
who credited and popularised Quimby. Quimby's own writings were all published posthumously. Warrenfelt Evans started as a Methodist minister, but in his 40s he discovered both Phineas Quimby, whom he went to for healing, and the writings of Immanuel Swedenborg, the Swedish mystic, thus setting him upon this new dual vocation of being both a minister of the Swedenborgian church and a practitioner, advocate of Quimby's mental healing methods. If you would like to continue exploring with me Western esotericism, the imaginal and the path of the mystic, then start now by subscribing and clicking that bell so you don't miss anything. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.